Hello everyone. Welcome to the special session on quad and strategic cooperation between India and Australia organized by the Tilotama Foundation. I am Kamakshi Vasan, Vice President and Director of Academic Programs, Tilotama Foundation. Tilotama Foundation works globally in the areas of international relations, diplomacy, area studies, gender, environmental, scientific, strategic and defense policy. The Indo-Pacific remains an important focus area of the foundation. We have a dedicated Indo-Pacific Center at the Tilotama Foundation, which publishes the weekly Indo-Pacific Bulletin with all the latest updates on the region. I am pleased to introduce our distinguished speaker for today, Professor John Blacksland. He is a professor of Intelligence Studies and Intel International Security at the Strategic and Defense Studies Center at the Australian National University. He joins us from Sydney, Australia. Thank you, Professor Blacksland, for being here today to speak on this very relevant and interesting topic. I would now like to request Professor Blacksland to start with this address. Over to you, Professor Blacksland. Kamaski, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure and a privilege for me to be here with you. I'm actually in Canberra, not, not in Canberra, not in Sydney, but it's a same time zone, just a couple of hours drive away. Um, but uh, I, I'm really glad to be here and to talk about Australia-India cooperation. Um, and uh, of course, you know, when we think about Australia-India cooperation, it goes back a long way. We've been, we've been uh, diplomatic partners for 75 years. Uh, we've celebrated uh, the recognition of each other's uh, uh, states for this year, the 75th anniversary. But that's, of course something that's been reinvigorated in the last uh, 16 years or so, going back to the days of the Indian Ocean tsunami, where we saw Australia and India collaborate on humanitarian assistance and disaster relief uh, efforts aimed at alleviating the, the terrible suffering that was experienced range right across from Sri Lanka through to Bangladesh and Thailand, across to Indonesia, particularly Aceh and the north tip of Sumatra where Australia focused a lot of its efforts. But we realised that Australia and India um, have a lot in common, have a lot of shared interests, one of which is, of course, maintaining peace and security and stability in the shared space, the shared commons. Uh, and that were obviously generated initially some collaboration, particularly with Japan, which was also very active uh, following the Indian Ocean tsunami and the United States as well. Now, there was a blowback to that because of China's objections uh, in about 2007. Um, but essentially, uh, we saw the Australian government at the time very eager not to cause offence, not to, to be uh, generating tensions with China. Uh, and we arguably didn't explore the issue in terms of our own national interests. We let the Chinese interests take over on that issue at the time. What we've realised is that there was no gain from doing so, um, and that we're now back where we were in terms of bolstering the quad because we're seeing that it's in Australia's interests uh, as it is evidently in India's interests and Japan's and, and the United States interests to collaborate and to compete. Now, com competition, it's been bandied around slightly as a bit of a dirty word, but in actual fact, competition by and large can be a very, very healthy thing. And I don't think we need to be shying away from competition. It can become quite adversarial um, and uh, much like in when we play each other in cricket, it can sometimes get a little bit aggressive. Um, but if, as long as you stick to the rules, as long as you adhere to the, the, the protocols, it can be very successful and very rewarding for those who are participating. But it also gets the participants to strive for excellence. And this is something that I think the quad is doing, uh, which is really, really a very, very positive thing. But let me just step back a minute. From, from that kind of picture of the quad as, as generating, as us striving for common excellence, to think about what we do have in terms of the overlap of interests. And obviously, you know, cricket's very well known. We all know how, how much we share in that space. But there's more. There's the rule of law. Uh, and, you know, that's one of the legacies of the, the political systems we've both inherited is a commonality, a federal uh, parliamentary Westminster systems where we have uh, legislative arrangements between states and federal government uh, entities 
that uh, closely approximate each other to a, to a, to a large extent. Um, and obviously, uh, we are both members of the Commonwealth and we both operate officially in English, although you could argue that Australians don't speak it very well. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and so it's understandable. But I think we're also, we're, we're members of the Indian Ocean Rim Association. Um, we are mindful of the governance challenges in the neighbourhood, uh, in the Indian Ocean and in the Pacific Ocean, and it's been heartening, actually, for Australia to see uh, India engage in the pursuit of common interests, particularly relating to governance in the Pacific Ocean as well. And he, when, when I talk about governance, I mean uh, dealing with corruption, uh, political corruption, um, uh, people smuggling, drug smuggling, the breakdown of law and order, terrorism, and, and, and so on. These are all aspects of the of governance challenges that particularly small uh, micro states in the Pacific and Indian Oceans have a real challenge with. They have a significant issue with. And in part, it's because they're so small that they actually struggle to have the governance mechanisms, the oversight and accountability mechanisms that would pre prevent corruption from becoming endemic. Uh, now, you know, arguably it's, you, you know, there are critics that abound that say that, that in corruption is endemic in Australia and in India. Um, uh, and, you know, there's no doubt that there's, there is corruption in both our countries. And there's no doubt that our governments are also making efforts to stem corruption, to counter that corruption and reinforce the work of oversight bodies, uh, inspectors, general policing uh, and auditing functions in government, which are very really important in liberal democracies for the function, the effective functioning of the of the separation of powers in the executive, the legislative and the judiciary for that to function. Now, that's not what we see in countries like China. Um, so we're seeing um, we're seeing in addition to that, we're seeing a, a surge in trade ties uh, between our two countries. We're seeing a surge in economic and educational ties between about our two countries. Um, and um, we're, so we're seeing the Australia-India Comprehensive Strategic Partnership signed in June 2020, the Australia-India Economic Cooperation and Trade Agreement in April 2022. Um, these are all adding to momentum to the deepening and broadening and strengthening of bilateral ties between Australia and India that build on the work of the Australia-India Council, which is 30 years old this year, it goes back to 1992. Um, and the Australian government has the new Centre for Australian-India Relations, which is looking to bolster investment, bolster uh, trade and personal ties, with, particularly with the Indian diaspora. Of course, now about 3%, a bit over 3% of Australia's population, over three quarters of a million of our population, which is only 26 million, over three quarters, nearly a million of our population now is, is uh, of Indian descent. Uh, either Indian born or of Indian parents. Um, and that is that is generating a space for collaboration that's happening on a fairly natural level. A similar phenomenon is happening in Southeast Asia, but in Southeast Asia, it's more diffused politically between Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, Philippines, et cetera, all these different countries that are in the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. In the case of India, there's one federal government that we deal with, and that is providing an opportunity for increased collaboration, the Maitri program, the friendship program, the education and scholarship programs, and the exchanges. We're still seeing more students come to Australia to study um, uh, in, in the post-pandemic light than, than we have for a long time. And the, the, the trajectory is a very, very positive one. Um, and despite the, the stories of a few years back of, of, a, of Indian students having a difficult time, the overwhelming majority of Indian students in Australia um, relish the time here. A lot of them like to stay, and those who go home go home with fond memories, by and large, of their time here. So there's enormous opportunities there for uh, more to be done. And look, there's more being done. The Australia India Innovation Network to increase investment and the supply chains, the Australia India Centre of Excellence for Critical and Emerging Technology. That is a really important area for collaboration. Australia, our industries, our, my own university, 
A lot of corporations are suffering cyber attacks uh, on an industrial scale. And we know that there are many sources of those attacks. A lot of it's from state-owned bodies. A lot of it's from major crime groups, syndicates, um, and also uh, other hackers as well. But there's, it's, we're, more, we're more dependent. We've gone from being web-enabled to web-dependent, and in turn, we're vulnerable. And that vulnerability calls for collective concerted action to counter the, 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 the damage uh, that's arisen. Um, and of course, in addition, we've got now five Australian diplomatic posts across India in Mumbai, Chennai, Kolkata, Bengaluru, and of course, the High Commission in New Delhi. Um, we've got the Bay of Bengal Trade and Energy Partnership, the Bengal, Bengal Connectivity Partnership, all which speak to a surprising level of little known connectivity between our two countries. So when we think about where to from here, uh, we know that India and Australia have a real interest in upholding the so-called rules-based global order. Now, I liken it to the Holy Roman Empire of the med medieval Europe, you know, which wasn't holy, it wasn't Roman, and it wasn't an empire. And I think the rules-based global order is kind of like that. Some people say there are many rules-based global orders. That's one way of looking at it. The bottom line is though, that both of our countries have an interest in ensuring that trade between countries is honoured, it's respected, and is reciprocated, that the rules apply, that they are adhered to, and that the arrangements are of mutual benefit, and that we reinforce bodies like the UN, the World Trade Organization, um, and so on, that, that are of enduring utility to international trade, to bolstering security, stability, and prosperity, and that's good for all. Um, now, obviously, those things are under some considerable challenge at the moment. Um, and we've seen that we've seen that particularly in Ukraine. Um, and I think when we think about this, it's worth reflecting on the limits of where Australia and India overlap. Uh, obviously, we have some differences on how to approach Russia on this, but we both share an interest in preventing escalation and in facilitating de-escalation and a cessation of conflict. And I think there are ways when we can cooperate and collaborate with each other to think creatively about how our nations can actually contribute to, to ending the war in Ukraine and changing the dynamics there. Um, on Myanmar, uh, there is scope for collaboration there. Myanmar obviously is a direct neighbour of India. Uh, you have a stake in what happens there. You have a stake in the security and stability of Myanmar. We both have a stake in the effective efficacy of ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Neighbours, which you neighbour and which we are a partner nation to. And there are a range of bodies in this construct, ASEAN ministers meetings, pluses for defence, for foreign ministers, senior officials meetings or SOMs as they call them, that are related to the East Asia Summit, the ASEAN Regional Forum, the, the ASEAN AMM, ADMM, AFMM, AFMM constructs in which Australia and India collaborate and find common ground on a range of issues where we really, we're, we're in very parallel paths, sharing of values and perspectives about how to make progress on bolstering the, the, the strength of ASEAN, making it more economically prosperous and, and in return, more of a trading and security partner with us on issues of mutual concern and interest uh, for investments, for trading opportunities and so on. Um, and, and so that's it's very interesting to see how those meetings have an, an allowed for greater collaboration and greater awareness of each other's mutual shared interests. Um, and obviously Taiwan is a hot one as well, thinking about what can happen there. Now, Unfortunately, I think on the Taiwan front, we, we get a very binary view of the world. People say, well, you know, you're either pro-war or anti-war. I just think that's a simple and unhelpful construct. None of us want war. We want peace. And most of us want Taiwan to stay the way it is without it actually becoming militarily occupied by China in a war of aggression. Now, if the Taiwanese change their mind, and let's see the other way, flip it the other way, if China changes its mind, changes its mind, 
and wants to stop being an authoritarian one party, one dictator state and wants to become an open liberal democracy. Well, I think the Taiwanese would welcome that with open arms. In fact, we all would. Um, and it's the, the authoritarian and control behavior of President Xi that is the most unsettling of all of this, which is reinforcing the need for both of our countries to think cleverly about how we can work together to mitigate the risks arising from Xi's adventurism. Now for India, that's most clearly manifest on the line of actual control in the Himalayas. Um, and for us, um, it's also manifested in trading sanctions that we've experienced um, as uh, China exercised its so-called wolf warrior diplomacy and its sharp power trying to punish uh, for those apparent indiscretions on our part, which are really just us exercising our sovereign rights as independent nations. So there's some uh, room for collaboration there, particularly as we think about how to de-escalate, how to deter conflict, how to mitigate the risks of conflict. And swapping notes between us is really, I think, a very useful, useful thing to do. And of course, the other area that's worth particularly dwelling on, and this gets to you know my more my comfort zone, if you like, which is the Australian Defence Force Indian Armed Forces collaboration. Uh, and here we've seen a, an extraordinary development in the last few years uh, from uh, the 2006 MOU on defence cooperation, which followed the humanity, the tsunami, uh, to the 2014 bilateral uh, framework for security cooperation between our two countries. Uh, and that's then got onto the 2020 Secretary's Strategic Dialogue, the two plus two foreign ministers and defence ministers dialogue. Um, and of course, a series of exercises, exercise Malabar, which is primarily naval, as we know, with uh, India leading and Japan, US and Australia being invited, Australia for the first time in 2018, reciprocated with exercise Pitch Black, an Air Force exercise in Darwin, where India has been participating for the last couple of iterations. Um, and 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 so on, including OS Index, an Australia and uh, India tri service Army, Navy, and Air Force activity, which the last OS Index included a thousand Australian military personnel. Pretty significant. And of course, increasingly, we've got shared platforms. So we've got the C 17, we've got the P 8, we've got the C 130, we've got Chinooks. Um, and in more and more, we're finding there's areas for op uh, overlap and sh swapping notes and interoperability and exchange postings uh, and officers and uh, soldiers and sailors and air, uh, 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 air personnel being involved in, um, uh, in, in, in working with each other. Um, we've got the mutual logistics support arrangement and the defense science and technology implementing agreement. Now these are actually significant documents and, uh, and arrangements of trust and collaboration that speak to Australia and India both recognizing the utility of closer collaboration in response to a growing range of security challenges. Um, and I think when we think about uh, the world we live in, and you think about particularly of the last week or so where we've seen the CCP, uh, you know, the kind of rubber stamp, the reappointment of President Xi, Xi chairman for life, um, and, the, and the fairly adversarial speech he gave, and the uh, conversely the national security strategy that's emerged from Washington, uh, signed off by President Joe Biden, um, that talks about competition. It talks about containing Russia. It talks about grappling with a range of challenges for which they are looking in a more respectful way than previously to collaborate with Australia and India and Japan and others as well as possible. So that's very interesting. And I there's I think what we're seeing is this space is, I, I would contend there, there was a book about 24 years ago called a, a Chinese book called Unrestricted Warfare, which came out talking about media warfare and psychological warfare and lawfare, law, legal warfare. And it seemed a little bit over the top at the time. Um, but what we've seen, of course, in the last few years, particularly with the wolf warrior diplomacy and the military expansion, rapid and dramatic expansion, is kind of the, this this that that book coming to a large extent coming to fruition, coming to to be to be true. 
I think, though, it's useful to get away from thinking about unrestricted warfare because we don't like using the term warfare about things where, where warfare is not declared or where people aren't shooting at each other. But we are in, I think, what could be best described as unrestricted competition. It's a pretty muscular competition. Um, and I think that allows for collaboration on a range of issues. It allows for challenge. It allows for contestation. It allows for compromise. And at times bordering on conflict, but hopefully short of kinetic war. Now, that's, of course, that requires the deft skill of the diplomat and of the politicians of our nations to act wisely and in an informed manner about the challenges ahead. One of those challenges is one I touched on briefly before, and that relates to Myanmar. Myanmar is becoming increasingly a vortex, a sucking vortex for instability that is eroding the effectiveness and efficacy of ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. It's causing turmoil on the border with Bangladesh and India, as well as Thailand, and is screaming out for creative, inventive, collaborative solutions. And here I think there are a couple of ideas that might be worthwhile putting on the table for Australia and India to contemplate. Back in 1992-93, Australia, Japan and Indonesia were instrumental in signing the Paris Peace Accord that allowed for the rehabilitation of Cambodia into the family of nations through the UN Transitional Authority of Cambodia. That was a remarkably successful uh, process. Now, it, no one country could pull that off. It required extensive networking and engagement and collaboration. Similarly, with the East Timor crisis of 1999, um, uh, uh, there was de devastation across East Timor. Australia was called upon to act, to assist with a UN mandate, um, but Australia couldn't do it without the support of other countries. So Thailand offered first, then Philippines, then Malaysia, Singapore, and a various a range of other countries, Japan included, helped out. And I think I think there's a model there that we could potentially look to apply to, to Myanmar. Now, you people say, oh, John, Myanmar, it's, it's impossible. It's catastrophic. It's never going to, we're never going to be able to help them. I'm wondering, I think perhaps if we were to put our heads together and work collaboratively on a solution where we perhaps persuaded the fellow Theravada Buddhist neighboring military led country, Thailand, say, to engage and be a conduit for engagement, uh, respected engagement, uh, that is about de-escalation and uh, allowing the people of Myanmar to have their say while not implode, not seeing the country implode. That, that, that sounds easy. That devilishly difficult to pull off. I recognise that. But there is scope, I think, with some leadership, some creative, inventive diplomacy for our countries to make a contribution to regional security and stability that in itself may well be a, have a demonstration effect about the goodness of the Quad the goodness of Australia-India bilateral relations and of the utility of this kind of international rules-based collaboration. So I'll end it at that point and happily take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Blacksland, for your insightful presentation. John, you comprehensively covered the India-Australia cooperation in diverse domains, dimensions and regions. You talked about cooperation at both bilateral and multilateral levels. India and Australia are very important partners in the Indo-Pacific region, as well as members of the Quad. I agree that there is also great scope for synergy between the two countries in our respective issues with China, although in different ways. Mm. You talked at length about the defense cooperation between India and Australia, between the Indian Armed Forces and the Australian Armed Forces. You talked about the joint defense exercises involving the both sides. You also mentioned the increasing number of shared platforms between the two forces, as well as the rise in interoperability. You also rightly noted that the two sides are stepping up collaborations and cooperations to face a growing range of common challenges. Hmm. You noted 
that the Chinese activities in the Indo-Pacific and particularly the events of the recent Chinese Communist Party's Congress that was aimed to re-elect President Xi Jinping of, uh, uh, at the top. You talked about the Chinese book titled Unrestricted Warfare. It is true that today the warfare moves beyond the traditional conventional frontiers. The book obviously even talked about the legal warfare, etc. Today, we see increasing instances of wolf warrior diplomacy from China. I agree that today there is a need to strengthen the cooperation between India and Australia, given the present set of diverse challenges. Thank you, John. Let me pose some questions now. So how do you see the role of the Quad and the role of Australia and India strategic cooperation in the context of the major flashpoints in the Indo-Pacific region? For example, the security situation across the Taiwan Strait, situation in the Korean Peninsula, related to the ballistic missiles being frequently launched or tested by North Korea. So obviously the developments in Taiwan or the Korean Peninsula are a long way away from India particularly by sea route as the bird as the bird flies as, as a crow flies as they say it's not further than it is for Australia we're, we're you know we both have concerns and understandable uh, uh, worries about what those challenges may present um, India obviously has a very different equation in terms of managing any blowback from engagement on these issues because you have a very long land border with China um, and you have already experienced the, the wrath of China with its brutal attack uh, on the line of actual control uh, not that many months ago um, on a gratuitous basis that was really uncalled for. Um, but it seemed to be a demonstration of a kind of relentless uh, expansionist uh, militant approach that China takes. And I think... When India looks at what happens at, the, on, at Taiwan or on the Korean Peninsula, it is worthwhile thinking about the broader ramifications of the abuse of uh, the international order um, and the, that, that may be associated with those uh, mil military, military actions. And um, so it's in, it's in the interests of India and Australia for the for the. United Nations to be as effective as possible, for the international tribunals to be as effective and relied upon as much as possible, for dispute resolution, arbitration uh, and judgment on, um, you know, the International Court of Justice, which ruled on the border between Cambodia and Thailand, for instance, uh, the arbitral tribunal ruling, which ruled on um, the, the Nine Dash Line in the South China Sea, which China chose to ignore. Um, these are really useful mechanisms for us to be supporting and rallying other quest countries who may be sitting on the fence to support as well. Now, India has cachet, has influence in the third world in a way that Australia doesn't. You know, we have perhaps more influence in the Pacific. Um, you have more influence in 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 um, in parts of not just South Asia, but uh, Africa and to a certain extent, Latin America, that, that we don't have. Um, and I think there is a scope for collaboration there. But it gets to my earlier point too, uh, and that is about the, uh, the, the desire for us to work to deter, to act in anticipation of violence, to cut it off at the pass, to make it less likely by making it more of a challenge for the would-be aggressor. So that unlike in February this year, we, where Putin thought he could get away with it, in future, should there be another such incident, the would-be aggressor will think, oh, I don't think I can win. I won't do it. Uh, and that's effectively what we're hoping will happen in Taiwan. That President Xi, who we know was training to conduct coup de main type activities like Putin tried on Kiev in the opening days, to try and seize it with special forces from the air. That 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 kind of thinking has gone away now, but now they're thinking about, well, what do we do about other forms of pressure? So this is where I think it's really important for us to be continuing to swap notes, collaborate, and, and generate diplomatic pushback and uh, uh, generate a, a clear message to India that the costs to it would be too great. 
for that path to be followed. Um, and then for them to maybe consider, you know, following the 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 the, the wisdom of the world's largest democracy in the world, and you know, democratizing like India. Um, you know, this is the great this is the great uh, humiliating uh, point of comparison. Both India and Taiwan. Uh, India is the largest democracy in the world, and Taiwan, as a fellow, uh, you know, ethnically Chinese and Chinese Mandarin speaking nation democratic how dare they you know it's it's outrageous particularly when president xi is so keen on stamping the communist china uh, communist party of china uh imprint uh on all aspects of society inside china and beyond thank you thank you professor Prof, uh, blacksman uh another question is that uh how does australia look at the pacific region in 2022 particularly its relation and strategic policy towards the Pacific Island nation, especially in the context of China's growing influence in the region? So, yeah, great question. So, uh, look, I've argued in a, a paper I wrote called the Geostrategic SWOT Analysis for Australia that we are facing, clearly we're facing great power competition. There's no question that is part of the equation. But we're also seeing looming environmental catastrophe. We're seeing storm surges, sea level rise, you know, society is very, very vulnerable, facing existential challenges. And then on a, in addition, we face what I mentioned before, the governance challenges, a suite of governance challenges, people cups, people smuggling, drug smuggling, corruption, counter terrorism, breakdown of law and order. All of those are actually compounded by the great power contestation and the looming environmental catastrophe. And they're accelerated by the fourth industrial revolution by the fact that you can reach out and communicate and influence people's thinking and politics on their TikTok, on their Instagram, on their phone, on their mobile device in front of them, um, at home, in bed, at, in the office, everywhere. It's pervasive and pernicious. This, this presents a real challenge for our countries to think about how we manage, how we maintain being an open liberal democracy, how we maintain our democratic principles uh, and our uh, emphasis on equity and justice uh, without suppressing uh, and suppressing uh, without suppressing genuine and uh, appropriate dissent. Dissent in and of itself is not harmful. It's uh, it's when it is outside the bounds of the rules, where in, when it's about overthrow, when it's revolutionary in its intent, when it's about destabilizing and, and obviously uh, uh, you know corrosive of, of state authority that, that's the that's the fine line um, for the Pacific for Australia so we've got the three areas looming environmental catastrophe great power contestational challenge and governance issues in the Pacific we have tended to focus on the issue of China and the Pacific Island people have said look for us the existential challenge is the environment. Uh, and there are others who would say, look, it's about governance, it's about policing, it's about corruption, it's about terrorism, people and money and drug smuggling, right? All of those things. Depends on who you ask, you'll get a different answer. What we're needing, and we're starting to get there, uh, is a recognition that it's about all of the above. It's all encompassing. And that the strategy formulation, the policy response requires a multifaceted long-term respectful engagement and that's something and this is why it's really interesting to see because now we're seeing india collaborating with australia on this as well we see india engaging in fiji in solomon islands in other parts of the pacific as well and this is by and large very warmly welcomed in australia because of our shared interests and our common concern about all of those issues great power contestation looming environmental catastrophe the spectrum of governance challenges and the problem of accelerated fourth industrial revolution implications. So for us, it's requiring a fresh outlook. It's taking, the, and the Penny Wong, our new foreign minister, has been front-footed, very constructive and proactive about this, which I think is really good. And there is more to be done. So we've had this thing called the Pacific Step Up. I think we need to do a lot more. I think we need to, need to have several steps up. Um, in terms of engagement on education, development, diplomacy, security, et cetera, economics and trade on a range of fronts. 
to demonstrate that we're there, not just as fair with the friends, but uh, friends in times of need and in crisis. And increasingly, I think there's scope for us to actually think about political en enlargement. And I, I think there's a model that has some utility worth comparing. Some people said maybe ASEAN is the model. I actually think maybe the European Union, European Economic Community initially, maybe that's a model we can consider for the Pacific Island countries to incorporate, to work with Australia and New Zealand um, to help them manage the series of challenges they face. Uh, water, sea level rise, corruption, uh, push pressures from you know other out, outside powers and so on. And I think that that can be done collaboratively and I'm hopeful that that that's the direction we'll be taking things in in the future. Yeah, thank you, John. Yes, India has a renewed interest in the Pacific Island regions. It is engaging with the region. And mm -hmm. I agree that both climate change and security challenges are crucial areas to consider in this regard. Of course, you are right about the great power competition in the Pacific region. Moving on to the next question, talking about shared platforms between the two forces, what cooperation do you see with India in the areas of defense acquisitions? As we know, there is an India-Australia joint working group and material cooperation. Mm. The two defense ministers of the two sides met in June 2022. They talked about the need to develop further opportunities for industrial cooperation between mm. India and Australia to increase the resilience of power of the supply chains and deliver capabilities to their respective defense forces. So there's definitely a lot of opportunities there. I mentioned some of the platforms which we share, I think, where we can collaborate. I think we should be looking to collaborate on other maritime uh, platforms as well. I think particularly on the cyber and the space front, there is scope for more collaboration than we've had so far. We both are vulnerable to um, cyber attacks and cyber exploitation. We have an interest in becoming more resilient in the face of persistent and uh, pervasive threats. Um, and we also are uh, still, both of us, I think, not as advanced as we could be in terms of our space capabilities. And I think there's opportunities for us to collaborate more in that domain as well. Um, but there's also, you know, just in terms of Australia's defense force is quite a boutique defense force. It's not a very big one. Uh, India's is much larger. And for obvious reasons, you know, Australia's got a big moat we're an island continent. We're not. We don't border two nuclear armed states that have been at times quite hostile to to us. Um, so you have an understandable, uh, reasonable uh, concerns that justify a robust defence posture, a more robust and resilient defence posture than Australia. Um, but I think increasingly, as we as we look into the future, there's more and more opportunity for us to. Uh, exchange ideas, uh, maybe send more people on on uh, on, on our, each other's training programs. Uh, we already have uh, students at the College of Defence and Strategic Studies and at our staff college, but that's a onesies and twosies. I'm thinking perhaps on a larger basis of swapping notes, really considering, okay, what, how, do you, how do you face these challenges? How are you dealing with cyber? How are you dealing with land? Uh, you know, the, the, how are you thinking about responding to drones? How are you thinking responding to hypersonic missiles? Uh, you know, these kind of things that are, they're genuine concerns that, um, that I think we should be looking to collaborate further upon. Thank you, John. Uh, now I would like you to bring two other dimensions to the discussion. Hmm. So could you please talk a bit about cybersecurity and intelligence cooperation? So cyber security, you know, it's all things to all men. Now, Cyber, cyber is many things. It's it's about the computing and the cables um, and the the connections, the, the the machinery that connects the ones and zeros that make us able to have this conversation. You know, that's the the technology. There's the security mechanisms that you put in place to protect that technology from being corrupted, disrupted, damaged, or closed down, or to, or co-opted, or uh, uh, taken over. Um, and then there is, uh, in addition, there is, um, so there's cyber awareness, so there's cyber in, in, in cyber espionage, if you like, it's about understanding how uh, potential adversaries could use their, 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 their cyber technology, their IT, ICT. 
um, and then working out how to defend against that uh, and also expose vulnerabilities that that might present. Um, and that is, um, that's not just a peripheral function anymore. It used to be considered something that you'd get the signals call people to do. You know, they would they, they would just do it. And that, you know, you, you say, you gotta go and sort that out. It's now becoming much more central um, because we live in a, a, you know, a digitally enabled world. And that world is multifaceted. It's about the hardware, it's about the people, it's about what's happening in between our ears too. Because there's that information warfare domain as well. So you've got to, you've got, you know, what, which part of the cyber domain are we talking about here? The hardware, the kit, the technology, the cables and computers and the electricity running the connecting the ones and zeros that are the messages of digital communications now. The security mechanisms to protect it, the shield, the sword, if you like, to be able to strike, the, the spyware to, in, to understand what the adversary is potentially doing. Um, uh, or, or the effect that it's having on our children's minds and our electorate and our people, as as uh, you know the you know the battle over who's right in Ukraine, which side should we support? Uh, are the Russians bad? Are the Ukrainians bad? Uh, should, you know what message are we believing? Uh, a lot of things. We are all being bombarded daily with messages from both sides looking to influence. You know, I heard somebody tell me the other day when we heard about about the the explosion of the uh, Nord Stream gas pipeline in the Baltic Sea, and this fellow said to me, "Ah, oh, it's it's you know the the uh, the fact the claim that it's Russian doing that's all just that's all just American psychological operations, they're all just deception." I'm thinking, hang on a minute, that's what the Russians are doing too. So let's not just pretend that this is one thing that the Ukrainians may, maybe with some help from the United States are doing. Both sides are doing it. And we need to be alert to the fact that this is not just a one-way street. This is multifaceted. It requires a sophisticated set of capabilities. So you need people who are uh, great, you know, perhaps a little bit nerdy, who are like computing and like sitting in a basement with lots of screens and working through, you know, making sure the network actually functions properly. You need others who like to actually work work out how to get into a system and how to understand how another country's or another uh, potential adversary system works. You need someone else who's prepared to think about how to use it. And then you can need another type of personality entirely to think about how that information that's passed through those means can affect the way they think to favorably or disfavorably affect the course of a particular conflict. Complex, but very, very interesting and incredibly important. And we need to do a lot more in that space. Great question, thank you. So my final question is of a more normative nature. First of all, thank you so much for a detailed response to my questions. So, uh, you know, how do you think this emerging great power competition, which some people like to call as a new Cold War, but which can escalate into a military conflict anytime, as we are seeing in Ukraine. So what kind of war do you think will be fought within this in the coming years? What will be the nature of that war? How to deal with such a war? How, who will be the soldiers in such an unconventional war as in an information war? Thank you for the great question. So I actually don't think the Cold War metaphor is a helpful one because the Cold War was very different. The, in the, during the Cold War, we lived in a very bifurcated world. There was the Soviet bloc, there was the West, there was the non-aligned um, uh, with some engagement with both. But, you know, it was there was not that much engagement with the Soviet bloc sphere outside of it. And India is an exception because of its own unique circumstances and the challenges you faced in dealing with China completely understand. Today, though, we're more interrelated now than ever, uh, and that's less and less happening with, with, um, with Russia, and to a certain extent, the national security strategy that the Biden administration has just announced will see a greater de-linking, uh, de uh, bifurcation of the trade, um, but that will take time, and even so, uh, you know, even with all of the sanctions that have been imposed on Australia, for instance, 
China is still our principal trading partner. They still buy you know, an enormous amount of material from us. Um, and that's because Russia, uh, China is not a closed economy. They may want to be. They may want to be autarkic. They may want to be self-sufficient, but they're not. And they won't be for quite some time. Now, they're trying, and good luck to them, um, but they won't be for quite some time. Um, and so we are actually more dependent on each other than ever. Um, and the idea that, oh, we'll just think about the Cold War metaphor, and that's where we apply those principles. To this. I don't think that's relevant. And as I was trying to get at before, when I talked about unrestricted competition, we're facing all of these things happening at once. So you can have collaboration on some things like policing on trade rate negotiations on uh, nuclear nuclear weapon nuclear rules nuclear power standard rules you know and specifications and uh, or um, agreements on um, uh, reducing greenhouse gases agreements on um, how to reduce poverty uh, agreements on how to uh, facilitate uh, the you know uh, the reconstruction of countries that have been uh, uh, struck by war or pandemic or, or crises. On you can have competition. And as I say, sometimes competition is good. Sometimes it's really healthy. I mean, it gets countries like us to actually think, oh, maybe we should do more just so that we, because we're competing, you know, we don't want to be beaten. We don't want, uh, you know, a country like China to get there first or to do it bigger and better. So maybe, and this is why we're seeing collaboration on, rare earths, for instance, and minerals and exploration and investment in each other's countries to explore uh, uh, opportunities. Now, I've heard some economics critics say that's a waste of time, it's inefficient, it's not sensible. I would contend they are missing out on a very big factor here, and that is that uh, if you are serious about making your country more resilient, you need to be prepared for the, the dark prospect one that will hopefully be avoided, but the one that you need to prepare to if you want to avoid it, and that is the prospect of war. You don't avoid war by pretending it doesn't happen. You avoid war, in my view, by making sure you're well informed about your potential adversaries' actions and you're well prepared to deter them from exercising those options. And that's an area where I think Australia and India could really do a lot more collaboration, thinking about how we deter war, how we prevent more conflict in the Indo-Pacific in the future. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, John. So uh, just to ask uh, the last question. So as per the discussion, you know, it was very interesting. So how do you see the both the nations, you know, in the future? Like, how do you see them working together or the context of India and Australia being together in, and, you know, the the current uh, situation of China, you know, consider, considering that also. So how do you see both the nations working together in the future? So I think we've seen uh, a bipartisan agreement in both India and Australia for greater enhanced collaboration. And as I say, I think there's opportunities for us to collaborate, particularly in the Pacific and in Southeast Asia in helping to bolster security, stability, and prosperity in those countries, uh, be it in Solomon Islands, in Fiji, in, in Myanmar, and so on. And I think we can be exemplars of collaboration and of creative problem solving, creative solution making. Uh, and that, that's, I think, that's something we really, you know, India's renowned for its intellectual abilities, for its, you know, in, ingenuity on so many levels. Australia's got a larrikin can do attitude that uh, you know helps us occasionally break through and win some cricket occasionally you know and, uh, and also but also just come up with solutions like we did in East Timor like we did in Cambodia and I think collaboratively there's some space some real opportunities for some out-of-the-box thinking that is going to be much better than the sum of the parts thanks very much um, thank you John for that thought-provoking answer it was a pleasure discussing India-Australia strategic cooperation as well as the security challenges in the Indo-Pacific region with you today. Thank you once again for joining. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you. Namaste.